This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, today you're going to hear a number of talks, um, many of which have to do with the structural specializations of the human brain, specializations of cells, uh, specializations of connectivity. What I want to talk about instead, even though I'm an anatomist, uh, not a physiologist, I want to talk about s some specializations of human physiology. And most of the evidence for these um, specializations is indirect, and my path to them will seem perhaps a bit indirect as well. I want to start by talking about the distinctiveness of human aging. These are respectively the oldest well-documented human being and the oldest well-documented chimpanzee. Now, when I talk about the distinctiveness of human aging, I don't want you to think that I think everything about human aging is distinctive. It's very clear that we share a lot of aspects of, of aging uh, with other primates and with other mammals. These pictures make some of those differences abundantly clear. We both get gray and withered and arthritic and all that nasty stuff. But despite these common features of aging, there are important differences as well, and, and one of the most profound differences, I think, is that Madame Camon here lived to be 122 years and 144 days old, and chimpanzee Bula died at age 59 years, and that, that's the oldest chimpanzee that we have. Now, this seems to be, these are extreme cases, but in general, it, it does seem to be the case that humans have the potential to live much longer than do other primates. Um, we are actually among the, the longest lived mammals. Now, assessing lifespan is, is, is difficult, it's problematic. Maximum lifespan is one measure that people use. Of course, I just showed you that it's 122 in humans and not 100. But um, so, that, so every time you use that metric, you're, you run the chance that somebody is going to outlive it. But you can also look at median lifespan, which is a little more resistant to outliers, and you get much the same result. So, it's important also to recognize that, that these differences in longevity are not artifacts of modern medicine or nutrition. If you look at survivorship in hunter-gatherer societies, which are represented in the, in the upper lines in this graph, and compare them to survivorship in wild populations of chimpanzees, which are in the lower line in this graph, humans clearly have a longevity advantage. And if you visit hunter-gatherer communities, you will find that there are people there who are in their 60s and 70s. So life expectancy uh, is not the same as lifespan. Of course, life expectancy numbers are, are strongly biased by, by infant mortality and early, early life mortality. So, so what? So, uh, you know, mammals all age. It's a, it's a, it's a general phenomenon of, of mammals. And perhaps it's just the case that Human, the human lifespan is, is merely a, a stretched out version of a chimpanzee or a generalized primate or mammalian lifespan. And that's a very appealing idea. It's an appealing idea particularly to people who study model animals like rats or mice or monkeys and think of them as models of humans. It's, it's, it's challenging to, for them to think that there's something unusual about humans. But I want to argue that, that there, there is likely something very unusual about human human lifespan. If you just consider, for example, the reproductive period of, of females, the, the time between puberty and, and menopause, humans, human females have about the same span of reproductive life as chimpanzees do, maybe even a little bit less. And humans have this very, human females have this very extended period of post-reproductive life. What evolutionary sense does it make uh, to preserve individuals who are not contributing to the gene pool? This is a 
potential evolutionary paradox. And the way this paradox is usually addressed, there are a variety of flavors of theories about this, but the, it, they all boil down to this. It makes sense to keep elders around if they can enhance their fitness by enhancing the fitness of their children. And so the idea is it's good to have grandmothers around, possibly grandfathers too, because they can contribute to the upbringing of of their children's children, either by contributing resources or contributing knowledge, something of that sort. And, and this intergenerational transfer is, is a quite distinctive feature of, of human beings. So I want to argue, first of all, that humans are exceptionally long-lived and that we were selected in evolution for longevity, that it, there was positive selection for longevity. The second point I want to make is, this, is a seemingly quite trivial one, but it's still very important. And, and that is that human brains are extraordinarily large. I don't think I need to belabor this point, but the human point is up here. If we, we know that brain size is influenced by body size, so when we consider the brain size of an animal, we want to sort of factor uh, body size out of it. But for mammals of our size, humans are an outlier. We have bizarrely large brains. And an even simpler way to look at this is to compare human brain size to that of chimpanzees. Adult chimpanzee body size overlaps that of adult humans quite a bit, and yet our brains are about three times the volume of chimpanzee brains, and about 13 times the volume of rhesus macaque brains, animals that are commonly used as models for humans. You know, great, a big brain. You know, that's the, obviously that's a very good thing, um, and it is, we hope, in many ways, but it also has its downside. Brains are very expensive tissues. If you look at the proportion of body mass occupied by, say, the brain and by skeletal muscle, uh, the brain represents a relatively small fraction of body mass uh, compared to muscles, but, but the energetic cost of the brain is about as high. So brains are very expensive metabolically, just brain tissue alone. And then when you consider how large the human brain is compared to that of, of chimpanzees or other primates, you realize it's a tremendous energetic load to carry. And it's, it actually gets worse than that. And to explain how it gets worse to that, I, I need to talk a little bit about the relationship between body size and metabolism across a large group of animals. So this is, represents work by several generations now of, co of comparative physiologists. And they, what they do is they consider the size of the organ, uh, organism and they measure its metabolic rate, usually, usually basal metabolic rate, and they plot out these log-log plots. And what you find is that in log-log space, there's a fairly linear relationship between body size and, and metabolism. The interesting thing is this works not only for body size, but also for the size of organs, and even, I, I am told, the, the size of organelles within cells. So this is quite a robust phenomenon. The interesting thing is that as, as size increases, metabolism increases, but the rate at which metabolism increases doesn't quite keep up with the rate of size increase. So the slope of this line is less than one. What that means in, in, in more concrete terms is if you take metabolic rate and divide by size, brain size or body size, what you get is a measure of the amount of, or the rate of metabolism, in this case, oxygen consumption, the rate of metabolism per unit of tissue. And because this slope is less than one, Every additional unit of tissue that you add to a structure means that every one of those units runs at a slightly lower level of, of, of metabolism. So as brains or bodies get bigger, every unit of tissue uses less energy. So a gram of mouse is energetically much more active than a gram of human. That's the, the key idea here. Now, how expensive are human brains in terms of, of their metabolic activity? Well, we have a method now that we can use to study this, and, and it's a nice method because we can use it in humans and we can use it in animals. It involves imaging brains with positron emission te um, tomography, which is a technique that measures radiation in the brain. What we can do then is we can give subjects, humans or animals, a radio-labeled glucose analog that's taken up in the brain and stored there uh, temporarily at a rate that's proportional to metabolic rate. So what you get from the PET camera is a picture of how much radiation there is in a tissue, which is a measure of how rapidly that tissue is using glucose. We have measurements 
from these sorts of techniques from a variety of different mammals, including rodents and rats in particular, also rhesus monkeys, and no surprise, rhesus monkeys have much bigger brains than rats, and their metabolic rate per unit of tissue, where here the unit is 100 grams, their metabolic rate per unit tissue is much lower than that of rats, even though their brain overall is using a lot more energy. So where should humans lie in, this, in these graphs? Well, you know, humans have much bigger brains than rhesus macaques, so their brains ought to be down here somewhere. In fact, uh, the published literature on this suggests that the, the tissue-specific human metabolic rates are about equal to or perhaps even higher than those of, of rhesus monkeys. That's quite remarkable. So the third point that I want to stress is that human brains run hot, hotter than expected. Now, again, um, you might think that running hot, just like having a large brain, those are good things. And presumably, the reason that human brains are running hot is because they're doing more of the things that brains do. They're making connections. They're, they're instantiating systems of neural inter, interconnections that um, instantiate our cognitions and perception and so forth. They, presumably, these things are giving our cognitive abilities some sort of oomph, to use a technical term. <laughs> Um, we don't really, however, have good direct evidence that this is true. I don't know of a lot of direct measurements of, of, uh, of, of neuronal activity at a, at a cellular level that you can use to compare humans to chimpanzees or, or rhesus macaques. But there are some kinds of indirect evidence that bear on this, and some of this evidence come from comparative genomic studies, which look at, at levels of gene expression in the brain across species. Recently, there's been more work on protein and metabolites, and I think they, they make a coherent story. And that story is that um, among the genes that are um, most affected or most changed in human evolution are genes that are involved in energy metabolism, synaptic activity, synaptic plasticity, things like that. So there is some additional indirect evidence to indicate that, in fact, our, our brains are doing more of these things that brains do. A good thing, right? But there's a downside. Um, just as there's a downside to having a big brain, a brain that runs too hot comes with certain liabilities. And one of the major liabilities is vulnerability to oxidative stress. So what is oxidative stress? Well, when tissues burn glucose and oxygen, they generate certain destructive molecular byproducts. These are called oxidants. They're things like superoxide or hydrogen peroxide. They're also known as reactive oxygen species. They're also sometimes called free radicals, which has a, a, a nice sort of political sound to it, but it really has <laughs> nothing to do with politics. Um, these reactive oxygen species damage cells and tissues. They, they, they damage proteins, they damage lipids, they damage, damage DNA. So they're ver very destructive. And um, one would think that the human potential for oxidative stress in the brain is enormous because not only are our brains running hotter, but when you consider how much longer we live than rhesus monkeys or chimpanzees, that the total lifetime um, glucose consumption is about three times that of rhesus monkeys, for example. And when you consider that, you know, humans have these um, neurons which are not replaced during life, you know, we can go 80 years running at a very, very high rate of metabolic activity, and yet somehow our cells manage to survive this process, or at least most of the time they seem to survive this process. Oxidative stress is thought to be one of the major factors in aging generally, and it's thought to be in involved as well in, in um, creating the conditions for neurodegenerative disease. And it's very interesting that among primates, um, age-related neurodegenerative diseases seem to be largely confined to humans. The best case, the best documented case, is Alzheimer's disease, which is a disease that produces a profound degeneration of both gray matter and white matter, leaving you with a brain that looks quite shriveled compared to a normal brain. And there are no documented cases of Alzheimer's disease in, in non-human primates. In fact, some of the microscopic pathological signs that occur fairly early in Alzheimer's disease, we don't see those in non-human primates either. So one possible downside of having a brain that runs hot 
is that it can burn up and, and leave you in a, in a very bad state. Now, even if you manage to duck Alzheimer's disease, un unfortunately, there, there is no way out completely. Even in normal aging, humans seem to undergo a fairly profound decline in neural tissue, both in the gray matter and the white matter. And the white matter differences probably actually have more to do with cognitive decline than the gray matter uh, ones do. The gray matter changes are, are really not, not uh, very striking until you get, or, or don't seem to have as close a relationship to, to cognitive decline. Uh, it's interesting that, that actually the amount of myelin that you have in your brain, this is the stuff in the white matter, the stuff around the axons that carry the electrical signals, um, it actually increases up to about midlife, up to your 40s, basically, and then it starts to, to tip over. And this is now a very well-documented uh, phenomenon for a number of different parts of the white matter. It's something that's very interesting about this. The, even though the, the steep brain decline starts in the 40s, there isn't, in normal populations, much evidence of serious cognitive decline till, you're after, till, till after age 60 or so. So for neuropsychological testing, as I understand it, that you can use the same norms for adults up to about age 60, and then you have to start renormalizing the data because you do start to get some, some decrements. This disparity between the onset of structural decline and the onset of behavioral decline or cognitive decline, and you see this as well in Alzheimer's disease, is that, that the, the pathological signs occur way before the, the, the onset of cognitive symptoms. This has been referred to as cognitive reserve or cerebral reserve, and, and I would echo Alan and colleagues in, in suggesting that this is an important phenomenon about, about human beings. It's, it's as though we overbuilt our brain so that we could keep it running um, when things started to go bad. So there's an upside uh, to, to higher metabolic rates. That upside is enhanced levels of neural activity and plasticity, we think, although this is, again, the evidence is, is indirect. There's a downside as well, increased vulnerability to late life neural and cognitive decline. The mystery to me is how is it that, that we manage to postpone this decline for so long? And I, I don't think this is something that neuroscientists have really addressed as a specifically human problem. One can imagine several ways in which evolution has acted to help us postpone decline for as long as we can. One is, as I mentioned, overbuilding the brain, this idea of cerebral or cognitive reserve. The second is that we might enhance the protective and repair mechanisms in the brain. So for example, we, we have oxidative stress because we produce these oxidants. Well, there are certain molecules that bodies produce to protect themselves, antioxidants, which I'm, I'm sure you've all heard of. We could also look to glial mechanisms because the glia are sort of the damaged party of the brain. And there might be aspects of glial function that have been modified in human evolution. We might actually increase the tolerance for damaged cells. Now, often when, when, when cells are damaged, they, they undergo programmed cell death, the idea being you remove dysfunctional cells. But removing cells can have bad consequences. So maybe we just have a little more tolerance for cells that are a little wonky. That's another technical term. Um, finally, these mechanisms of plasticity that, we, that we've been discussing might, might actually interact with cerebral reserve. And so that as, as our brains decline, we can continue to fine tune them so that they can work appropriately or optimally with the resources that remain. Thank you. <laughs>